In the heart of the city, a highly touted new building project has ended with a grand unveiling. That's New York City. Liz Diller is an award-winning architect and co-founder of Diller, Scorfidio and Renfro. And her studio is behind some of the world's most iconic building projects, including the High Line in New York and the ongoing renovation of the Museum of Modern Art. She's been speaking to our Hari Srinivasan about her latest project known as The Shed. It's a public art center and colossal work of engineering with a whole section that can be moved around on wheels. Liz Diller, thanks for joining us. First, let's talk about your most recent piece, The Shed in New York City. What is it? Yeah. Um, the Shed is uh, a brand new cultural uh, institution that shows uh, the visual and performing arts under one roof. And it's all new commission programming. It sits on Hudson Yards. Mm -hmm. Um, adjacent to the High Line. So how did you come up with this idea? Um, so the idea um, sprang from a request for proposals from the city, and it was in 2008. It was when the economy was tanking, and it was really improbable to imagine a new cultural facility in New York. And so we thought, well, what does New York need that it actually doesn't have? And um, the answer is um, some place that actually houses all the creative disciplines in one place, mm -hmm. that's purpose-built for flexibility, and that's designed for a future that we can't imagine. The building has some unusual features. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about those features. Um, so the main uh, organization of the building is it's a, it's a fixed structure um, with uh, multiple levels, of which three are very tall uh, floors. Uh, four galleries and performing arts spaces. So there's a theater and uh, two galleries that are stacked. Um, and on top of the uh, fixed building, there is a telescoping outer shell that basically slides out onto an open space to the east. And when it does so, it um, encloses and shelters a very, very large space um, that can be heated and cooled. It could be an interior space. Um, in fact, doubling the f original footprint. So we're able to um, put on very large installations, very large theatrical productions, uh, all sorts of events. Mm. And when we don't need those events, uh, we don't have to heat or cool the space. We simply uh, roll it back, nest it back on the, um, on the fixed building. And uh, it's quite modest, and it opens up a big public space right next to it that could also be used for cultural programming. And what's structurally difficult about designing something like that? Well, it's hard to move an eight million pound building. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we worked with a team of engineers. And actually, uh, the structural principle is very, very simple. It's based on um, uh, c crane, uh, uh, crane technology that you see at uh, shipping ports. Um, and it's an industrial system that basically runs on steel tracks with steel wheels. Um, and the motors are at the very top of the building. And it's just a rack uh, and pinion system, which has mechanical advantage. So when it moves, um, the movement is silent. It takes only five minutes to open and or close the building. And it runs on a horsepower of one Prius engine. You can move an eight million pound building with a tiny Toyota Prius engine, or the equivalent of. Yeah, exactly. Wow. It's 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 from an engineering standpoint, it's extremely smart, sustainable, quiet, and uh, operationally very very easy to do. It's also adjacent to the High Line, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, for people who don't know the conversion of an elevated rail track into a walkway, into a park, into a public space. Now you are also behind that. How how does that connect to the shed? We made up an urban park out of it, and it's, uh, it's been really quite the rage. So very, very popular in New York. It's been, uh, there's been a viral effect mm -hmm. uh, all over the world. There are high lines all over the place. And it's led to a tremendous amount of transformation in uh, what we call the far west side, Chelsea and uh, Meatpacking District. And um, this transformation ultimately um, also incorporated uh, the uh, rail yards, and uh, which had previously not been built on. So the opportunity to do um, the shed is directly linked to the success of the High Line. 
um, and that whole transformation mm -hmm. of the West Side. Why do you think people connected to it? I mean, especially with these spin-offs around the world, what is it about walking just <laughs> <laughs> at this other elevation that yeah. connects with people? I, I think um, there are multiple things. One is that you're walking 25 feet off the ground and you can walk for a mile and a half without stopping for a light or a car to go by. So you have this wonderful promenade. You also see New York in a very different way, not the postcard views, not the very polished, beautiful things and, 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 and typical sites. You see a kind of subconscious of New York mm -hmm. that was never really meant to be seen. You mm -hmm. see these um, chimney stacks, you see alleys, you see solid brick buildings, you see laundry draped from people's windows. Um, yeah. it's, it's just a different side of New York that we don't typically see. But I think that there's one thing that people um, maybe don't think about, but that really resonates with me about the High Line. Basically, can only do two things. You can, you can walk and you can sit. Mm. So basically, it's a place for doing nothing. And in a city where everybody's productive all the time, uh, whether they're uh, working or working out, burning calories or shopping or, yeah. or on their devices, they're always doing something. And, and the High Line gives you a kind of license to really do nothing and take that kind of parenthetical moment in the day and just be there and look at other people and yeah. just hang out. I mean, in a way, that's not necessarily all the, the when you look at your body of work, you, you don't design that many spaces for doing nothing. You're also doing a lot of spaces that have a function in mind when you're crafting them, right? So is there a through line if we look back through all of your work? Uh, is there connective tissue? I think that there are several uh, strands maybe. One is a preoccupation with vision and the culture of vision, which incorporates um, all sorts of things like spectatorship, and um, uh, exhibitionism and voyeurism and um, just uh, op interest in optics um, and a kind of preoccupation and, an, and a kind of crit critique maybe with a preoccupation of vision as the master sense. So that's one of the through lines. Um, another one is a kind of um, desire to democratize space, mm. right? Um, an interest in publicness and um, even uh, on private property to always carve out space. And as um, our cities are getting progressively privatized, um, architects really have to be on the warpath here to, uh, to protect space and yeah. make sure there's enough for the public. Now, you're also part of a couple of uh, projects in Hudson Yards. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, endeavor. It's a concern has been that you know some of these types of projects are serving to make neighborhoods more elite. Um, how does that square with what you're just saying is your interest in trying to make sure that there are public spaces preserved? Yeah, I think that the city was very, very smart in organizing the open space and mm -hmm. making sure that there was enough open space, public space, open to the sky. Um, on Hudson Yards because it was privately developed. And they were extra smart, smart in um, identifying that parcel that would always belong to the city on which the shed stands. So that is, while it's physically within the four corners of Hudson Yards, it's actually New York City property and, mm. and will always be. That's the first thing. Be before any design takes place is just making sure that that's protected for public and cultural use. I also wanted to ask you about the, the project you just finished up in Moscow. What was the intent? What was the outcome? Ah, so Zarya Dye Park um, was uh, a competition, an international competition that we won. Um, and this was the time of Edward Snowden and the relationship between the US and, and, and Russia was already, it was, it was quite comp complicated. Um, People told us to not compete, not even bother, because an American had no chance of winning this competition. And we had our doubts about um, the government and you know, whether we wanted to step foot um, in Russia, um, and convinced ourselves that this is a project for the city of Moscow. So it's a 
35-acre park that sits right next to the Kremlin. It's basically uh, Moscow's equivalent to our Central Park. And it was the first time the site was liberated. Um, be before that, the Hotel Rossiya stood there, and it was a Soviet-era hotel uh, with 3,000 rooms, really mm. crazy, huge footprint of a building. And when they raised it, um, the first ideas was to develop it commercially. And then they decided that was not a good idea, that um, a park should be there. So they were very inspired by the High Line. And, uh, and I think that was the reason for um, our invitation to participate in the competition. So uh, now the park is open for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And the brief says, don't make a space where people could collect. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very, very clearly um, avoiding any kind of protest. Protests. Yeah, um, and and parks in uh, Russia and, and particularly in Moscow are all very formal, axial, and there are certain kinds of plants that are allowable, and and usually very, very formal gardens. So our idea was to actually make a place for people to collect. Uh, we called it wild urbanism, and. We thought about it as a place where, and similar to the High Line, where the paving system and the vegetation are intertwined in different ways. This project was so um, uh, embraced by the Muscovites. It was in the first month, a million people came. And it's one of the great attractions right now. And I think we got away with murder here. We made a place that was truly progressive um, in a government that may not have really understood entirely. Yeah. But we had a great um, uh, ally uh, with the uh, city architect. You had an exhibit where there was a building on a lake and you essentially had this giant fog machine, yes. but the fog itself was what people were interacting with. Tell me about that. Yes, yeah, so, um, so our studio uh, in, I believe, 2002 for the um, Swiss Expo, we decided to uh, make a structure that was inhabitable, um, that was out in the lake, structured there, um, that was a huge um, fog, a, 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 a cloud of fog that you walked through. Um, it was a 500 foot long bridge that brought you there. And then you found yourself on something the size of a football field um, with no walls, just a couple of platforms um, with four columns that went down into the lake bed. Um, but you were immersed in, in this mist, and you really couldn't see more than three feet of, ahead of you. <laughs> it was called the Blur Building. Yeah. Um, it became such a hit. And um, in Switzerland, they required every student to go visit it. And because it was amorphous and you couldn't quite see, you could hear this kind of hissing, um, of the sound of 35,000 fog nozzles, and you were immersed in it, and you could walk in any direction, but it came to represent this sort of notion of Swiss doubt, which I thought was really, really hmm. phenomenal. Being Switzerland, being in the middle of... Being in the middle of, and not knowing politically what you wanted mm. to do, EU, not EU, um, yeah. where, what, do yeah. you, what, what country are you with, yeah. uh, what language yeah. do you speak? And, and it was just a, a super interesting um, way of penetrating a country. You have been uh, teaching at Princeton for decades, and I wonder if in that time um, you've, seen, you've seen batches of students year after year. Is there a gap between the number of women that enter the profession and the number of women who either uh, stick with it? Because it seems a male-dominated industry at the end result, regardless of who's coming in to your classroom? Yeah. Well, it is very male-dominated. And when you think about it uh, from a cultural perspective, the association you would make with an architect mm. is a white male heroic figure. I mean, typically, that's um, uh, the very successful architects of the past have uh, sort of fa fallen into a certain type. Um, today, people work very, very differently. Um, there are many collaboratives. I work in a collaboration with three men, and one is gay, one is black, who is my husband, and one is white, the unusual white guy, you know, in a team with a woman. 
you know, three minorities, and essentially. Um, and it, so people work very, very differently today. Um, in terms of women, I, I, my classes are 50% right. female. There's an absolute gender balance um, in uh, academia, um, no different than uh, many other fields. And, but there's something that happens, right. um, that gap. Um, so women come into the workplace, um, there's a, uh, a disparity, I think, in um, salaries still. Mm. Um, and then as women progress, um, some have families and need to take time off. Um, some uh, officers are not that generous about giving women time off. Um, we have maternity and paternity leave, and we've always done it that way. Uh, and we encourage women to slowly come back to the workplace. But still, even in our studio, there's, you know, there's not a balance. It's not uh, mm. the way it is in, in the academic context. And I think we have to just think about it a lot and try to figure out what's really wrong here. You know, a lot of people in architecture, men and women, have to dedicate tremendous hours to it. It's a very, very hard profession. It's not one that you can just leave at 5 o'clock and then forget about it until 9 o'clock the next morning. Yeah. Is there a... Um is there a movement in the industry to address this, do you think? I think, I think many, uh, many I mean, firms are thinking about it. I mean, your firm might be one because there is a woman at the leader, as you said, three minorities in a way are running the firm, but that's not necessarily the case with most successful architecture firms. That's right? exactly right. I think role models are very, very important, um, seeing that other women have succeeded mm -hmm. and some women who really just sort of crack that glass ceiling and, and make it and, uh, and really transform that image of, of you know, that singular figure, that singular voice. It's strange because you think that we've gotten right. over that by now, but no, not quite. Liz Diller, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here.